Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I am so excited we're spending this time today. Our first guest is Andrea Matthews, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, Letting Go of Good. So welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Oh, my goodness. Well, I am so happy that we have you spending this time here with us today. And, gosh, letting go of good, that sounds like quite a title. Most people think, you know, grabbing good is like where we should be. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. We focused a lot on on trying hard not to be bad so that we're trying really hard to be good. And uh, and we and I, it's interesting. I've done so many studies about the good and good versus evil. That uh, and it's it's really interesting that there's so much written about evil and not much written about the effort to be good. It's it's a real interesting paradox there. Well, and so you know, I, I know that you're a psychotherapist and a writer and a speaker, and you, as you say, you've been studying this topic for quite some time. So what? You know, why would being good be kind of a bad thing, and how is that hurting us? Well, just as initially as a sort of general uh, viewpoint on that, it's uh, being good means I'm trying hard not to be bad. We can't separate those two concepts. They're both they're polarized uh, uh, opposites, and so they're connected to each other. One doesn't exist without the other. That's first, but they're also social constructs in that they're not really, uh, there's not really a one standardized version of good that exists throughout the globe. There's not one standardized version of bad that exists throughout the globe. There's different versions of good and bad that exist on, uh, in terms of, um, what happens in one country, one nation, one family, one religion, and that is, perceived to be good, it might be bad to another country, vers- uh, nation, religion, family. And it's not uh, so that we can't really conceptualize those two things, uh, uh, good and bad, as, you know, stagnant, immovable things. They're very fluid when it comes to being seen as a definitive thing across the globe. And so there's that. But the other piece is that we're ultimately measuring our worth based on a standard that's not that's too fluid to measure anything against. And so we we're deciding who's good and who's bad and whether or not I'm good and I'm bad based on standards that don't, you know, that don't even aren't even we can't even hold on to them. So uh, it's I think of it um as different from nature in the sense that nature doesn't ask itself if it's good or bad or if it's measuring up. I mean, you think of an oak tree, and I've used that analogy throughout the book, as, you know, starting out as an acorn, and it doesn't, you know, lay there in the ground as an acorn and go, gosh, I hope I grow up to be a pine tree. You know, it just grows <laughs> yeah. into what it is. It, it, You know, it is what it is, and that's who we are ultimately. We are who we are, but we're trying not to be who we are in order to be good. And that's the danger, is that we end up repressing who we actually are in order to strive after a concept that's too fluid to even grab hold of. Mm. Well, and I I found this to be such an interesting book and such an interesting topic because a lot of times, and you're like 100% right, I mean, I can even think about my own experiences, you know, trying to be the good person or trying to be the good role model or whatever the case may be. And it's always saying then, you know, the reverse of that is that we are not good enough, you know. Right. Right. And I think we strive. The, there are some people who I've uh, sort of outlined in this book as the good guy identity. They they have an identity with goodness in that they they are not able to allow themselves to do anything that, that would be conceptualized as bad by anyone. So what they do is strive after the highest good. And in the process, they're ending up repressing a lot of really natural feelings that could be informing them of what's true and authentic within them. But also what's what's happening is that they're ignoring external signals as well so that they get themselves involved with people, uh, places, and circumstances that are not good for them, that are toxic for them, in fact. And they won't let themselves get out of that because they think it would be bad to get out of that. So... If I'm with an abusive spouse, for example, I might stay with that spouse hoping that I can, you know, sacrifice myself enough to make him see how much I love him. And then 
he'll stop being abusive. And, of course, there's two things involved in that. There's bargaining with the idea that he might change. But also there's this concept of goodness that I've got to live into, and I feel like I've failed if I can't be loving and kind enough to this person who might be being abusive to me. So many times we we ask, unfortunately, we ask, why didn't she leave in those abusive situations? And we rarely ever consider the fact that maybe she didn't leave because she's trying too hard to be good. That's That really would have one thinking quite a bit about good, and I and you brought this up a little bit, and I would love for you to expand on this, good versus, you know, being genuine. Yes, and, and yes, that's the whole, t- the whole nature of the book. Um, it, if I'm striving after a construct, a social construct, what I have to do is try hard to fit me into that construct. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm going to do is end up repressing the, the things that are genuine or authentic within me. And I'm going to, and I'm going to, uh, put on a mask and costume that seems to fit that social construct. So I'm going to tell myself, for example, if I'm, serving others constantly and I'm always being there for others and always being kind and always doing yet saying yes you know the church calls me and asks for another cake or they call me and ask me to serve on some committee or they call me and ask me to do this that or the other and I'm saying yes 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 to all that because that would be good to do I'm then proving to myself and to the world that I'm a good person and I do that all because I'm so afraid of being a bad person way down deep inside of course I might not know that but I'm doing it for that reason. I'm trying to compensate for a, a, a low-grade sense of unworthiness. So, I, I, you know, I'm not being genuine. I'm not able to say no when I'm too tired to say yes. I'm, t- You know, I'm not able to to decide which, which deed that I might do is coming from genuine compassion and which is coming from a should, an ought to, or an obligation because I'm so driven just to do that thing I always do. I'm almost robotic with it. I just do good, I do good, I do good, I do good, I do good, all from a preconceived idea of what good is. And and so, therefore, I'm repressing all that might be authentic within me. And what I find so many times is that when people come into therapy, they might say to me, you know, I, I've, I've got these terrible feelings of resentment, and I want you to make help me make them go away. And, of course... I'm not going to be able to help them make them go away um, because that's not the job of any therapist to make feelings go away. But but also because it, it what that resentment might have come to say is you're doing a lot of stuff that's not really authentic for you. Stop it. And so the resentment has come to be my helper, but I'm trying to make it go away. So they really have to look at changing behaviors as far as, you know, maybe honoring themselves about, you know, maybe I'm too tired to make a, you know, a bunch of cupcakes for um, this social group or, or um, church or whatever organization I belong to. You know, maybe I need to really, you know, listen to what my body's saying and focus on some rest and um, being able to be okay doing that and not have it be like a bad thing because I didn't make some cupcakes, you know. Yes, and what what very commonly people with a good guy identity, and this is epidemic across our country, uh, particularly mm-hmm. in the West, but it's also in, around the world, um, that people are trying so hard to live into good, and and um, and I whatever idea of good they have, that could not be related to religion, but it might be related to um, just a social idea of what a good person, a kind person does. Yeah. And so, you know, they're living into that. And what happens when they try to say no, for example, somebody calls and asks them to bake another set of cupcakes, as you said, and mm-hmm. they, uh, some, some, you know, they're not able to say no. Why? What is it that prevents them from doing that? Well, it's this extreme feeling of guilt this, it, that just overwhelms them with, if you don't do that, you're going to feel so bad later. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make you feel bad. So the guilt is almost like this horrible slave taskmaster that just, you know, drives them to be compelled to have to keep doing good and doing good because they're so afraid of that terrible feeling of guilt if they don't do it. The slightest infraction makes them feel terribly guilty. So that's the flip side is that they're being ordered around by guilt. And guilt is a form of anxiety that leads them to believe that they've done something wrong when, in fact, they might just be doing something fake. Oh, 
And it, it really, it, and I'm sure when they, you work with people and they're first learning to make changes where, you know, maybe they're looking at themselves first or looking at things in a different perspective where they feel okay with, with not having to do things they don't really feel that they want to do at the moment. It's okay to say no sometimes, you know. Um, yeah. You must get a, a lot of them that kind of struggle kind of going back and forth with that initial feeling of that guilt coming up. Yeah, that's a really difficult thing because it, you have to be able to walk through the guilt and hear it as a, a message that comes from something toxic rather than something that comes from something healthy. We've been taught to believe that a guilty conscience, I just did quotes in the air there, <laughs> a guilty <laughs> conscience is is uh, a a good thing, that we're supposed to feel guilty, you know, and then if we don't feel guilty, then, wow, we really are bad people. You know, we ask, for example, about the psychopath or the sociopath, whichever terminology mm-hmm. you use for that, you know, if he didn't feel remorse, then he must be a psychopath and a, and a or a sociopath, and I, I do agree with that definition of a psychopath and a sociopath. Nonetheless, you can't necessarily transfer that all the way down so that if you don't feel guilty, you must really be bad because many people feel guilty when they're, you know, striving constantly to be good and no one they know would ever think of them as bad people. They would nec- very commonly think of them as as uh, selfless, really genuinely good people, although they're not being genuine at all. So, you know, it, it, that that idea is that w- we're living into, that again, that construct of so, of good that is a social construct that isn't, it's too fluid for us to pin down. So we're trying really hard to be something that no one, that we don't ever know for sure if it, it's genuine or not. But if we can look inside and operate from real compassion, you know, when, when it's time to serve somebody else to ask myself the question, is this real compassion? So, for example, if somebody comes knocking on my door from XYZ Charity and they ask me to get donate to that charity and I feel really guilty and I say, okay, I'll give you $10 and they leave and then 20 minutes later another charity that I'm really passionate about comes to the door and asks me, you know, for a donation while well, my $10 is gone now and I don't have any money to give them. So it, it, it's like I've used up my energy on my shoulds and my have tos and my ought tos, and there's no time, energy, or thought left for compassion. And that's how we've lived for generations. We've decided that duty, obligation, is a good thing, whereas compassion is, you know, not even can be can't even be trusted. In fact, I believe, and this is just Andrew Matthews' theory. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that the reason we uh, initiated the whole concepts of good and evil was because we didn't trust our own truest authentic self to be compassionate and to be, uh, you know, uh, care about other people, or care about ourselves enough to do what's true in, inside of us. We didn't trust that. So we made up these false constructs to to create this wall around us so we'd be good people. And if you look back over the generations, it's not working. Well, and um, this actually kind of brings up a question then. So, because um, you did mention sociopaths, could some of these constructs be have uh, been created in order for, to protect us from people who just don't have the range that 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 caring, compassionate range that uh, most people have. Well, I think that's entirely possible. Like I said, mine is a theory, and I, I don't have any evidentiary proof of that. But but I, I do believe this. If a person can identify with goodness and try really hard to be good, mm-hmm. a person can also identify with badness and try really hard to be bad. Ooh, that's and a burn right that, there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we can absolutely uh, identify with that. And, and, and the whole idea for me is that if we didn't have these concepts of good and bad, then mm-hmm. people wouldn't identify with them at all. There'd be, we'd have to look for something more genuine inside of us. Um, so we've, we've leaned so heavily on these constructs that we don't even know that we've divided everything on the planet up into good or bad. Every, even what we eat is either good or bad, you know. So, <laughs> and that can change with time too. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, it can. It certainly has for me. So, 
So, you know, it, it, a child can grow up in a home, for example, and this is a whole other book, but, but, mm-hmm. but the idea is he can grow up in a home where, for example, and this is just one example of many, yeah. um, he might have hyper-religious parents who are real moralistic and rigidly moralistic, and, and if, in the slightest little infraction that he does is considered to be bad. And what's happening over time is he's being reinforced for being bad, and he might grow up really believing that the only way he can exist at all is to be bad. Now, there's I, so much I have that, a theory that... Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. I'd love for you to finish that, that thought. I have a theory that that's how the psychopath evolves, that, that they identify with good, but with badness. In the same way that uh, the good guy identity identifies with goodness, mm-hmm. so that they become that and they try to do more and more bad just to keep proving that they're really here. Yeah. It's kind of that push against society, you know, mm-hmm. saying, well, you know, this, these are your constraints for good and bad and I'm going to push through those. And, right. Uh, Right, and I'm going to also, you're going to highlight me for that. I'm, I'm going to prove that I exist because I'm going to be on the front page of some newspaper somewhere. You know, that Mm-mm. that really, I can look at that newspaper and say, see, I really am real. Yeah. Well, and so for, um, because I know there's so many, and, I, you know, your book really outlines so many of the lies that society has taught us about, quote, like truth. You know, and so when someone's walking through this and they're reading your book and, and let's say, um, may, perhaps working with you, um, what are some of the ways that they go about starting to heal from this kind of over feeling of always having to do good and be the good person? Yeah, I think one of the first ways is to make friends with uh, some of our most difficult feelings. I think we, uh, you know, even in the new age, new thought, um, movement uh, where there's not a lot of sort of rigid re- morality hanging around there um, there is this idea of negative and positive mm-hmm. and again that's it, it's real similar to good and evil in its context but uh, if you it, it, what they've said you know is that we shouldn't have any negative feelings and so we talk about our feelings in terms of negative or positive feelings but they're not negative or positive they're just some of them are more difficult than others and so if we can begin to make friends with the feelings that are more difficult, they have messages to give us. In fact, all of our emotions are just a part of an internal messaging system that's meant to get our attention and talk to us about what we're really up to. And so, you know, for example, when you feel anger, we think of that as a negative emotion and that we shouldn't have it and we should push it away. And all that happens when we do that is we... We repress it, and then it goes down into the unconscious temporarily where it's still a very active energy, and then it comes out later in some ugly, you know, way that is explosive. And so it's not really going away. It's just going into the unconscious temporarily, and it just sits around in there waiting for a channel to release. Whereas if we can, on the other hand, look at that emotion as uh, an opportunity to get to know our own authenticity better, then it can deliver a message. It can say... I'm here, I'm real, and I matter. And I think generally speaking, not specifically, but generally speaking, that's what anger says to us. It says, I'm here, I'm real, and I matter. And so when we get really mad, we can see those elements in our anger. If somebody has said to us, you're not really real, you don't, you, you don't really matter, you're not really here, you're being, I'm just going to dismiss you. Mm-hmm. you know? And so we get mad. And so we can definitely misuse anger like we can misuse anything, but but it, it's really meant to be a message to us, for us, and about us. And if we use it that way, then it can, can begin to talk to us, and then we have got an inner guide that's sort of directing our lives. Instead of directing our lives by should, ought to, and have to, we have an inner guide. And the same is true with um, our personal powers, in- intuition, discernment, and desire. Of course, we have to really learn to discern those. What What is intuition? How is that different from just fear? Or what is discernment? How is that different from judgment? And what is desire? How is that different from compulsion or compensation? So we have to really get to know ourselves in order to to uh, to work with these energies. But that's the whole point, is that trying to go inside and work with these energies inside of us experimentally 
helps us to get to know ourselves in a deeper and deeper level. And so that, I think that's the pathway. And, and what a profound place to come from. So when you're feeling like that anger or that upset, I think anger and fear are probably an easy one to, to go with. Um, you can kind of sit and, you know, kind of ask yourself, where is this coming from? And really kind of walk through how you're feeling about a certain place, person, thing, whatever the deal is. And move kind of through that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And Carl Jung talks about holding the tension between the feeling and the action. Mm-hmm. And, and that being able to hold that tension means that we're, we're sitting with it. We're just being able to go, okay, I'm not going to act on this right away. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to let it give me some direction. And when I get clarity, then I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to act on it. And that's kind of what separates um, reacting from responding. Yes, absolutely. Good, good point. Yes. <laughs> See, I, I learned some stuff from your book. <laughs> some great, <laughs> some great stuff, actually. You know, and it, I found it just to be extremely profound, especially on this topic. And it, it was interesting. This kind of came up amongst friends the other day. We were kind of going, you know, gosh, you know, living a life where you're always trying to be good can be exhausting, mm-hmm. you know? Oh, absolutely. And, and coming from this place where you have this, just kind of like, I'm just going to be who I am. It's such a beautiful place to come from. Yes, and it, and it isn't exhausting. In fact, it's energizing. And, mm-hmm. and the exhaustion is actually a message from your body that you're not doing stuff that's really authentic. Mm-hmm. And if we can begin, that, you know, that whole thing of just being able to listen to ourselves. And a lot of people would say, well, that's, doesn't that make you selfish? Doesn't that make you into a selfish person if you start listening to yourself? Well, first of all, that whole construct of selfishness is based in some really um, irrational ideas. Uh, mm-hmm. So we think that selfish means that any time I think about myself, I'm being selfish, or anything, I, any time I take care of myself, I'm being selfish. And in the South where I live, it's it's like, well, this may be selfish, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's how we talk about it. It's like you know, a bless her heart. That's another one. So oh, we, yeah. we, well, <laughs> well, I know the bless your heart really well. <laughs> yeah, that's a real uh, backhanded comment, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, so, so I, I might, this must be, I, I know I'm being selfish, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyways. What we're trying to say is I'm going to allow myself to be selfish this one time. When in fact we're not being selfish at all, we're, it, it isn't selfish to think about ourselves. It isn't selfish to be there for ourselves. It isn't selfish to be present for ourselves. It isn't present. It isn't selfish to be, to take really good care, nurturing care of ourselves. Yeah. But we've been taught that, well, maybe it's okay to take care of yourself because, you know, you have to uh, tighten up that tool that's supposed to be there for other people. So we see ourselves as like, well, I'm just a tool to be used by other people. But in fact, uh, taking care of ourselves is a form of self-love that is essential to being authentic. So if I if I can't love myself, how am I going to let myself be me? And that's the that's ingredient. That's one. Been, mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we really do have to really sort of fall in love with ourselves. And that, you know, we that didn't happen for a lot of us. M- most of us, you know, some of us were loved at least to some degree for our authenticity, but a lot of us weren't loved at all for our authenticity. We were taught to be whatever it was our parents needed us to be. And so we gave up our authenticity in order to please our parents because they were all wanting us to be good, whatever their image of good was for us. It was, you know, that that's what we were supposed to be. And so we tried to be that. And that's how we formed an identity in the first place. I've written a lot in the book about the concepts of projection and introjection and how that whole formation of the identity takes place. So I'm not going to go into the details of that here, but it, but the idea is that we do have a capacity to early, early on in life put on a mask and costume that isn't who we actually are, but is who, we, who we're pretending to be to please the people that we love and need desperately. And so we put on that mask and costume and we wear it, and a lot of times that has to do with being good and I'm going to be a good person, and very commonly it means that I'm going to be there for other people. I'm going to serve other people. I'm going to take care of other people. Um, and we see this very commonly in role where a child is what we call in the mental health field, we call a child parentified when they are the ones that are taking care of the parents instead of vice versa. 
And so a lot of times that child will grow up to feel like they have to be really good and take care of lots of other people, too. That's their role in life is just to take care of other people, and they're striving to be good because they've learned that this is how a good person behaves. They they take care really good care of other people. And a lot of times they will get themselves involved with people who won't take care of themselves to sort of prop up that role. I'm not mm-hmm. going to take care of myself, so I'll go find somebody who will take care of me. And they find somebody who will take care of them in that good person. And the good person ends up getting exhausted, worn out, resenting things, high blood pressure, arthritis, all kinds of stress-related diseases because they've spent their lifetime serving other people without ever stopping to think about themselves. And a lot of people would praise that and say, well, that means that's a selfless person. No, it's a person who's not authentic. That I, I just find that absolutely fascinating, but it it completely resonates. It makes sense, you know, because we all are constructs of our what our parents expect, you know, as far as you know. It, it, in a lot of ways, it mirrors what they believe um, they've been taught, you know, growing up about being the good kid or the good person or the good parent or the good employee, whatever the case is, without really um, diving into what fulfills them. Um, as a person, what makes them happy. Right. Yeah, and that fulfillment is us, That is that acorn becoming an oak tree. It's mm-hmm. just a real natural, you know, this is who I am and this is who I can become. It's not this is who I am, but I have to hide that so I can become what somebody else needs me to be. It's just this is who I am, so that's what I'm going to become. And that, that is how we absolutely fulfill ourselves. So fulfilling our desires, so to speak, and I mean, like I said a little while ago, um, is really, really important. And like I said, we have to learn to separate desire from a compulsion. A desire is not a compulsion. It's not like, you know, I'm an alcoholic and I want another beer. That would be a compulsion. Mm-hmm. But if, if uh, or a compensation would be I came from poverty and I have to be the CEO of the big billion-dollar corporation so I can make lots of money, but I haven't stopped to think about the tasks of the job itself whether or not I'll even like them. I just need to have the prestige and the and the money so I won't feel ashamed of my poverty background anymore. So that would be compensation. So we get that mixed up. We'd say, I want to be a CEO, and really what we would mean is I'm compensating for some difficulties with shame. Um, uh, so those things are not desire, but desire really comes up out of the, the deepest essence of who we are. And it, it says, I want peace of mind, or I want to have a life where I'm, have some freedom to do the things that I want to do or, you know, maybe I'm somebody who likes to travel. I I need to be able to travel. That's something I'm going to want to express. Mm -hmm. uh, Or maybe I want to uh, paint and I want to be an artist. And, and, you know, whether I'm very very popular for that or not, if I'm doing my art, that is me fulfilling myself. So it's, it's, you know, really living into those desires which – for the good person, the good per- the good guy identity, they've been taught to ignore their own desires and be there for other people. Just put those desires away and be there for other people. So, you know, to live out of their desires would seem selfish to them. They would think, oh, I'm being very selfish. In fact, I've worked with people that are so good guy identity uh, identified that they mm-hmm. that they are not able to identify a single one of their desires. They don't know whether they like chocolate or strawberry ice cream. They don't know whether they like coffee or tea. They don't know what they want to do on a Saturday afternoon. And so often I'll, I'll give them an assignment to do nothing but what they want for two hours on a Saturday, and they can't do it because they have no idea what their desires are. That's how yeah. how they've been taught to put be, put that away. Yeah, that their their you know wishes and desires for life really um, aren't important. You know, mm-hmm. that they have to rely on on you know this expectation to be good you know and this kind of kind of almost dovetails with um i know you talk about you know purpose as well and often i i could just (laughs) and i've heard some of your discussion on this so what if somebody comes to you a client comes to you and says well i need to find my purpose how does that play all into this as well well, of course, you know, I'm going to take the client from where they are and we're going to work slowly. But generally, just as general idea about that whole idea of purpose is that, is, you know, we, we have that idea that we're supposed to have a purpose. That we're, that if we don't have a purpose, then there's no reason for us to exist. 
And that's another false construct because it says that our existence itself is not enough. We have to add something to it to make it good enough. It's like, you know, we, we, we can't just trust that who we are as we are is good enough. So we have to develop a purpose. And I literally have had people come in and say to me, I'm 50 years old and I haven't figured out my purpose in life yet. And I believe that our purpose in life is to live, to live and fulfill who we are. And that that's it. There's no more of, to it than that. So we don't have to have some grand, noble in, uh, light from the sky drop down on our heads and go, oh, here's your purpose, you know. And that's what a lot of people are waiting for is for whatever, however they perceive God to to just enlighten them one day. That, here's your purpose. Here, here's your calling. Here's what you're supposed to do. And my question is, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to be doing? What are the tasks that you love? I'll often ask clients if you could do anything you wanted to do for eight hours a day and not be paid for it, what would it be? And Ooh. very commonly they know. They that oh, I'd be an artist. I'd, I'd you know, I'd be a, I'd be a, a quilter. I had somebody say that one time. They'd be a quilter. I'd, you know, I'd be, you know, doing the things that I love. Uh, Every now and then I run into a person that says, I'd be sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, when Maybe we work with it. So, what, much, so much expectation on them that sitting around doing nothing sounds like a dream, you know. <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly right. That's what it turns out to be, that they've been so exhausted from doing, doing, doing for other people that they're yeah. really tired of it and they would like to do nothing for a while. Yeah, just take that break and say, okay, just want to sit around and just rest. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, I've goodness. even had clients say that they they wish they could have a stint in the hospital. I'm thinking probably not. That's probably not going to be very restful for you. But, <laughs> but you know, yeah. the idea is that they're trying to get some place where they can go and nobody will bother them because they it can't seem like to be around. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and kind of where they're taken care of. You know? Yes, 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 absolutely. And and the idea that that I won't have to I, I won't have to be bothered by anybody who needs me. I'll be the one that's being taken care of instead. Yeah, yeah. They can't book a vacation to be around of that. <laughs> yeah, take a vacation instead. Absolutely, don't. Yeah, don't go to the hospital. You won't get much rest there. But uh, yeah, the the idea is that I can't seem to be around people without serving them. You know, mm-hmm. so I'm so compelled to serve other people that if they walk in the room, I have to take care of them. And that, that comes from that identity that just says, I have to be a good person. Let me prove it to myself again that I'm a good person. I'm good enough. I'm measuring up. And, you know, we talked about the guilt. When that guilt comes up, it's just so overpowering. So people just cave to it. But eventually, the reason it's gotten to be so overpowering is because we've obeyed it again and again and again and again. And it's become the central control for their lives whereas if they begin to disobey it it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it starts off being big and that means the first part of that's going to be difficult but it doesn't Mm -hmm. mean it can't be done it absolutely can be done and um, it's just a habit they've developed right yeah absolutely absolutely on to that well, gosh, Andrea, I mean, this has been such a fabulous discussion. I'm so glad we got to spend this time to, you know, together today. Where can our listeners um, not only, I, I, you know, purchase your book, but where can they connect with you to be part of your community? Absolutely. Um, uh, they can buy the book on uh, Internet sites, Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, or their regular brick-and-mortar store. They can order it there if it's not on the shelf. Um and uh, they can connect with me at uh, on Facebook at uh, uh, Authenticity Central. Mm-hmm. That's the, my uh, Facebook name. And Andrea Matthews is my – at Andrea Matthews is Twitter. So they can connect with me there. Um, I'm happy to connect with people who are interested in this topic and talk about it and, and, uh, and see, you know, what I can offer there. Now, um, if someone's saying, gosh, you know, I, I want to work with you, do you work with people virtually um, on this topic, or it, do they have to be within your geographical area? Right now they have to be in my geographical area. I'm working on the po- uh, possibility of getting a distance counseling certification, which we uh, we now have to have. It didn't used to be true that we mm-hmm. had to have those, but now it is true, and so I'm working on that, and once I get that, then I'll be able to do that again. 
And I'm sure you'll have that posted on your website at andreamatthews.com, right? I would. I would, absolutely. Oh, perfect. Well, we'll keep an eye out for that because this is a topic that really um, affects a lot of people, and I have never read anyone um, address it in the way that you have. And so, you know, Andrea, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed the conversation. This has just been a delight. We are going to pause here for a break, and we will be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient Secrets of Manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com Ben Wexler is a gifted leadership development and strategy consultant for professionals who want to transform their organizations and careers. Through a uniquely personalized set of processes, participants discover their unique knowledge, how to leverage that knowledge and experience, and then put it all together with a global strategy. You're more valuable, your organization is more valuable, and the change is viral. Contact Ben at 630-881-1074, 630-881-1074. The highly acclaimed and newly released book, The Hand Part 2 by Lynn Van Prague Grattan, describes the journey between a psychic medium and a family who lost a son. Messages from Beyond Eternity's Gate is of love and healing. For more information, visit www.lynnvanprog-grattan.com. That's www.lynnvanprog-grattan.com. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. I am so excited to be introducing our next guest, Rebecca Frieda McClaskey, and she's here today to talk to us about her new book, Breakup Rehab, Creating the Love You Want. So let's welcome to the show, Rebecca. Hello. Hey, what a joy it is to have you here. So gosh, you are the go-to person to help people with breakups. I like it. I'll take that title. And yeah, <laughs> I, I would say that that given... We teach what we need to learn, and and I've learned quite a lot. (laughs) Well, yeah, and I think your book is just such a great resource because a lot of people get really confused in regards to, like, when things go south in a relationship. But, you know, before we dive into your book, I would like our listeners to get to know you a little bit. So why don't you talk to us about... You know, just what inspired you on this path and to write your book, Breakup Rehab? Well, breakups suck. They're just like, they're like the worst. And, Mm -hmm. and I've had, uh, you know, my, my script, my life script is to make it to 37 and not be married, no kids, no divorce, none of that kind of stuff, but Mm -hmm. lots of breakups. A lot. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of breakups. So, so it was sort of a mix of life experience plus my um, job experience working in a, the field of addiction and taking people to AA meetings and really seeing how the 12 steps could be applied 
to someone going through a breakup, but I realized there's Codependence Anonymous, Sex and Love Anonymous, um, mm-hmm. and then all the other anon- anonymous is out there, but there wasn't something specific for breakup. And I was like, why doesn't this exist? And then I felt inspired to write it and – and the universe was nice enough to make sure that I went through a couple more breakups while writing the book so that I had plenty of material <laughs> to go through. Well, and then you could test your own, your own, you know, practice and, and get it down perfect for people like us who are kind of bumbling around. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, and you know, making sure and, mm-hmm. oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, it's just making sure that there's an actual guide too, you know, that it's not just like a, a hodgepodge of different information like you get when you go on the internet. Or hang out with your girlfriends and ask them, well, what should I do next? You know, or mm-hmm. at least they're getting um, a a professional's opinion because from what I understand, you graduated from Naropa University in Boulder, right? I did. It's, it's a very prestigious school for mindfulness training and um, psychotherapy so it, mm-hmm. it's really cutting edge and I just feel so just incredibly blessed to have my master's from Naropa. Wow and you know I'm I'm so I mean I'm in Colorado I, I love Naropa as well I think they're a great university and, and we're so lucky to have that here where people can partake of a more of a mindfulness kind of approach and I love how you um, you bring that to um, your book, you've got the, the 12 steps that's kind of incorporated there as well. And you could definitely say there's a mindfulness approach to how you're teaching. I like, I, I brought everything in the kitchen sink to writing this book because I have just a vast background. My, my dad was a, a pastor and a chiropractor and a hypnotist. So I grew up in that sort of environment. I went on to study um, psychology, and for as long as I can remember, I've been studying love and relationships, um, mm-hmm. being like, what is this? What is this weird thing that we're all doing called relationship? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and and then certainly my training at Naropa helped to like bring the Buddhist perspective, the idea of compassion to to this major life transition, to the major life transition that happens. Uh, for all of us, I think all of us that go through some sort of breakup at some time in our lives. I, I don't think there's anyone that hasn't gone through one type of heartache or another. And so, you know, for you, what does breakup rehab really mean? So the core of rehabilitation is to return, you know, to return to, I think, in this case, um, I would augment that and say to return to self because we get in relationships and so often we buy and sell things. It's a it's a, a barter system or sometimes a transactional system, right? I'll give you my body if you give me security, or mm-hmm. and and then and then I often hear people say that they lost themselves in relationships. So breakup rehab is really about rehabilitating the whole self and being able to bring bring that depth of knowing who you are into constructing your life so that you can create the love that you want so you really can have healthy relationships and and not repeat the old crap cycles of like selling yourself short or just a crumb. Yeah, your book really offers people Great advice on how to move forward when things are, I mean, relationships get messy, you know, and there's no reason to be messy with them. You know, I I really liked your chapter that talked about forgive and let go, and I was hoping that you can expand on that for us a little bit. And it's just like, I just really started off with a bang. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That chapter, just be like, let's put the hardest thing first. You know, Mm -hmm. because we can run around it, we can try to circumvent it, we can silver lining it, we can cover it up with a spiritual veneer of green drink and spin class or, you know, (laughs) whatever, how much chanting we want to do. But the only thing we need to, to, to let go, to truly let go, is to be like, 
I don't know God's plan for my life. I actually, it doesn't matter how much vision boarding I do or anything, it's like I surrender. What what vision does God have for my life? You know, what vision is it? Like I had this idea, this relationship with it. This was it. This is going to be my life purpose. And something else is happening. So that's the letting go. And, man, the forgiving, the forgiving is an ongoing practice where you don't hold yourself hostage to the past, where you're not dragging the past into your future, where you can say, that chapter is done. That's done. I don't have to relive it. I don't have to revive it. I can, like, I can, I can be grateful for what I learned and move on and move on to the next thing. So that, that is really why I had that as the first step is just to anchor people into exactly what's going to be required to rehabilitate and be able to move forward. You know, I, I, I think that's such great advice because I know just in breakups I've gone through or friends that I know that there's this repetitive thought about the person and, and you have to kind of stop yourself and go, okay, who's driving the bus here? You know, because this person's taking up so much of my time and in my head, you know, there's still something going on that I haven't released. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I recently went through a breakup. I spent this last month, like, just in that uh, monkey mind, that, that shoe mm-hmm. in a dryer where, you know, your mind is just like, if I could just say this or do this or get this back or – and you're constantly replaying that. And that's completely normal, by the way. It's because your um, your nervous system is literally repairing itself. Because uh, rejection or dismantling of a relationship, like leaving a relationship, will create an injury. It's a, like a, there's a physical injury that's happening, and your, and your rapid thoughts are your body trying to uh, repair it. So there's nothing there's nothing really wrong with you when you're in that space and interestingly enough what we often try to do is we think if I could just get back with this person then I'll feel better Mm -hmm. and I would just and really in the book invite people to do this too to say that that person's a part of your history not your destiny and now is your time to claim your life and your space because if that person was your person, they'd still be with you. <laughs> oh, yeah, with without you. a they'd doubt. They'd still be walking <laughs> with you. They'd still be going through the hard times with you. They wouldn't They wouldn't bail out. They wouldn't, you know, they'd be like, let's go to therapy together. The investment would be there. But we have this illusion, this delusion, and this confusion that, oh, if we could just get them to maybe tweak or change this. No, they want out. So you claim your life. You claim your life, and you start living it for you, like, immediately. Block social media and start the no contact rule like today. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think that's really, it's important to set appropriate boundaries because a lot of times people kind of let things, not, not always, but you know, sometimes I've heard of people letting things get kind of messy or, you know, it's kind of going on and on and tracking out as opposed to, hey, let's you know, either try to be friends or, you know, just kind of take a break. And, you know, it's not that either person's bad. It's just they're not a good fit for each other. Mm-hmm. That's really well said. It's not that either person's bad. They're just not a good fit for each other. And here's a real, hmm, this can really twist people up. When someone mm-hmm. comes to you and they're like, this is my truth. You know, as if it's just like the end all be all. This is my truth. And you can be like, well, I don't have to buy that. Your truth is my <laughs> lie. That's fine. <laughs> right? Your truth yeah. is this isn't working and your too bit is, that's my lie because that's not, that's not my truth. That's not where I'm at. And you, so what I'm saying is like, you don't have to buy anybody else's truth. You don't have to buy what they're selling. And and I think we get really confused and messy when we do that, when we're like, oh, you're right. Yeah, your, your, your truth is the truth. I'm like, mm-mm, you have to choose for you and, and take care of yourself. And so I think the best way to do that is the minute a person says, you know, when they're really like, I don't want this relationship, be like, I don't want somebody who doesn't want me. No, thank you. No, sir. Mm-hmm. Or if you're a person like leaving the relationship being like, this isn't working for me, 
then leave it and don't go back and forth. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was cute on, on Sex in the City, but not in real life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, do you know, um, I, I know in your book, you actually said something that really stuck with me. And it, it's, you know, in your chapter, it talks about examining your judgment, your judgments and responding with compassion. And one of the things that really jumped out was this quote from you. It says, the heart can't heal in an environment of judgment. And I thought, gosh, how true is that? When we're sitting there being in judgment about the other person or picking people apart, it it just kind of defines our limitations. You know, it, it's not putting us in a place where we can actually have compassion and move on for whatever the situation is. Well, also, like <clears throat> at the beginning of the relationship where we lacked discernment, you'll mm-hmm. find judgment at the end of the relationship. Uh, so mm-hmm. if you weren't discerning in the beginning of the relationship and you didn't take time to, like, get to know the person, let's say you jumped in bed to bed with them, which I have mm-hmm. checked off the list many times yeah. where I'm just like, this will work. Yeah, this will be fine. Never works. Um, no. <laughs> no. If you're not discerning, if you don't slow down and actually go on a couple dates with the person, get to know them, have the values conversation, um, then what will happen at the end of the relationship where you weren't discerning, you'll feel judgment. You'll be like, I was bad, they were wrong, I am right. And you'll just lock yourself into this cage that the heart's like, hello, can I get a little compassion here? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, can I just say, like, we tried, we learned, it was a lesson, it didn't work out, we weren't on the same wavelength versus, like, sitting in this, you know, just self-critical uh, or projecting really toxic place. And is that how people can, if they are seeing that they're in a place of just complete judgment, how would you recommend for them to move into, you know, a state of compassion? Because I know for some people that doesn't happen overnight. Maybe it wasn't a really good relationship. Maybe it was a pretty bad one. You know, so how can they move into compassion and kind of move from that judgment place? Well, first is breathe. It's just breathe. It's just mm-hmm. like come come fully into your breath. Like that's the seat of life itself is your own breath. Is that when your mind is like looping and you're thinking about what you could have done and part of you wants your ex back but the other part of you doesn't or maybe part of you's moved on and you feel like, Oh, thank God that's over <clears throat> But you find your <clears throat> but you find yourself in the same relationship. You know, you're just repeating the same patterns over and over again. Mm-hmm. The the best way to get out of judgment is to stop and breathe and count to five. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just break the cycle. Break the, this, And you can ask yourself, is this bringing me peace? Is this thought bringing me peace? Or is it bringing me more harm? And you have a choice at any moment. Like, it doesn't happen overnight. It happens every single second you choose it. It really is a journey as opposed to something that just happens. You know, I mean, it could happen, just happen, but it, it, it's really, it sounds like what you're describing is more of a journey through just kind of letting go of judgments and fears and, and kind of moving to that place of oneness. Mm-hmm. And, and self-awareness in that if we feel insecure, unloved, unlovable, too much, not enough, Mm-hmm. Um, we don't belong here on earth, existence, existence doesn't make sense, whatever that, you know, the deep belief system is that we're carrying around, um, that you can just, you can surrender that at any given moment and be like, I'm whole and complete and a child of God. You know, I'm whole and complete and a child of God, they're whole and complete, my ex is whole and complete and a child of God, and I don't, God is God and I am not. Like, I don't have to be the judge the jur- and the jury here. You know, I just have to choose what's right for me. I think that's very beautifully said, and it could be the God, the God of their understanding, whatever that is, you know. Mm-hmm. So, it doesn't have to um, anything. So, well, and I think, you know, it, it's just such a powerful place to come from when you can be in, you know, you can work on healing yourself, 
you know, because it's not the other person's job to do anything, but work on healing yourself so that you can then be in the right place should an opportunity come up later on down the line. Mm-hmm. Well, and the part of breakup that I think logically we can get on board with is that mm-hmm. we all deserve the chance to change our mind in a given moment. We do it all the time throughout the day. You know, well, do I want Asian today or no, maybe I want a hamburger. Well, I'll get mm-hmm. a salad. Okay, cool. We change our – the, the hamburger is not sitting there being like, oh, you didn't pick me. <laughs> you know, like – but but when it comes to building your life with somebody, there's a lot more on the line. There's a lot more on the line. But you have to you have to keep in mind at any given moment, we all have the right to change our mind and to take our lives in different directions. And that can look immoral or unethical or any of those things. But when someone, let's say you're the person who's broken up with, when that person decides, I don't want to do this any, with you anymore, then at that moment, whether you want to or not, it's your intense responsibility, complete responsibility to change your mind, to be like, I do not or will not be with somebody who does not want to be with me, who does not share the value of commitment in the way that I do. You have to change your mind. There's like, that's a, that is a huge step in healing. And, and I put this as a step in living your purpose, your unique purpose, not the other person's purpose, your purpose. Well, and you kind of touched on that at the beginning of the show. You, I mean, I've heard it often, too, where people say, I was totally lost in that relationship. And they seem to, you know, it's, sometimes it seems it's easy for people to give up their entire life. I understand compromise. I mean, we have always have compromise in relationship. But to really let go of who it is that they are in order to be in a relationship. And that's kind of, um, that's kind of a dangerous place to be in. Well, I recently joined CODA, Codependence Anonymous, and mm-hmm. I'm working the traditional 12 steps. And mm-hmm. really, codependence is like, you don't know how you feel unless someone reflects it back to you. Or you feel like other people can't take care of themselves, so you altruistically give to you know, and give and give and give, or you mistake sex for intimacy. Like all these things we do to contort, I call it emotional contortion, Mm -hmm. and to cut ourselves off from awareness, so to create our lives through stupidity. Stupidity is just cutting yourself off from the awareness that's available to you, where you're like, maybe I'm not in alignment with this person. Now, I say all this to say, of course, there's relationships that are healthy, where you have compromise and you, you share schedules and it's, you know, there'll be arguments and disagreements and there's, there's healthy discourse. There's healthy exchange in a relationship. But at the core, at the core level, the commitment, the commitment to self, to God and to the relationship are not in place. You'll lose yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there, there still has to be like, when I get into a relationship, I still have my hobbies, my friends, and the things that I like to do. And then I come together with somebody who has the same thing. And, you know, you, you touched on a part, a part that I want to kind of roll back on a little bit here about how sometimes people confuse sex for intimacy. And there really is a huge distinction on that, you know, just just because you engage in a sexual act doesn't mean that there's any intimacy there. Mm-hmm. Into me, uh, you know, the, the breakdown in the field of psychology is into me, into me, I see, right? So mm-hmm. you, you'll pick relationships that are mirroring you. Um, and there's something called amago therapy where we often are attracted to somebody because they reflect the disowned parts of ourselves. Like if we weren't allowed to be emotionally expressive, we'll pick somebody who's emotionally expressive. Mm-hmm. And you'll see that sort of like that pair, that yin yang pairing that happens that sort of like and at first it looks complimentary but the things that you love the most about a person will eventually annoy you because they agitate um (laughs) the parts of you that you shoved into your shadows you know yeah like oh i this is so great you're so attractive for this and then months later you're like i hate this this is annoying can you stop doing that (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, it, and usually isn't there a saying, if you spot it, you got it? So, you know, if, you, if something really annoys you that someone does within reason, that, that typically means that you're, there's something there that you probably need to work on as well. Mm-hmm. There's um, – so I'll, I'll use myself as an example. So I, I grew up really shy and ticked on mm-hmm. in school. And so I just had this – you know, it was – my life was very much – when you're bullied, you your survival is just like how much you fit in or how much you don't fit in. Yeah. And if you're if – you're, so that I've carried that sort of ugly duckling thing with me for a while. So what happens is I get really competitive with people that are successful (laughs) because I want to be that. I want to feel like accepted for who I am and to be able to be expressed and to be able to be received and to have it, you know, be a positive impact and to have those things happen. Um, Mm -hmm. But what I'll do is I make the other person wrong through my competitive nature. I make the other person wrong for their success instead of celebrating their success. Because I still feel, I still feel the aggravation of that disowned part. Well, I didn't get that. Why did you get to get that? That's not fair. Mm-hmm. We do that to people in relationships all the time. It, and it can be a major cause of what breaks people up. It's having that, that competitiveness. You know, that, and it's interesting. I've seen that before where there's that jealousy as well that comes with it. You know, so it's not like you're a team and you're cheering each other on. It's like, Oh, what? Like just what you're saying, just like, well, why this person get this? You know? mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, with I, I know yeah. you're just amazingly successful in the work that you do. What is like some of the like number one reasons that people come to you when they're trying to work through like their whole breakup thing? I'm like so glad you asked that question. It's such a good question. Like why people show up on my doorstep. Mm-hmm. And it's very much my moniker, freedom. They're, they're, they've tried traditional therapy and they've, you know, they've gone to yoga classes. They've done the things, you know, the, the scientific things, the spiritual things. But ultimately the people that show up to me are, re- they're, re- they're just ready for massive change. They're ready yeah. to just like break the pattern, to do it differently, to not live with anxiety, to be able to like, have more of who they truly are and be accepted. And and because I bring something really unique to the table, not only do I have my master's in counseling, but I'm also in psychic and intuitive. So like, uh, and a lot of, some people really, a lot of people are empathetic, but I have that really like sixth sense power to like watch the energy, to like watch what they're saying, hone in on it. And sometimes deliver, like I've had clients who've had, parents who have passed and all talk to their parents and we'll do family therapy with someone who's crossed over on the other side and it creates this incredible clearing so people come to me when they're really they show up when they're really like they're ready for the real thing they're ready for more Mm -hmm. of who they are and they're ready for healthy relationship i'm just ready to take it to the next level maybe they're tired of seeing because what's interesting is um, I'm I'm sure that there's some patterns there. Maybe they find that they're dating the same person like over and over again, or you know, there's a few things there that just um, it, it just feels like there's some patterns that they're falling into. We all have blind spots. I have them. We all have blind spots, and that's why going to it's not just your girlfriends or your clergy. But it's specifically mm-hmm. going to a counselor is such a game changer. You know, it's like, it's, it's buying you, it's buying you education you won't get anywhere else. And it's, it's absolutely, it's, I mean, every time I go back to therapy, I'm always like, I'm exponentially a better person when I'm in therapy versus when I'm out of it. So, mm-hmm. it's powerful stuff. It allows you to really continue that internal work, you know? Mm-hmm. And the book does that to a certain degree, too, you know, really mm-hmm. takes people through that process. Well, and that's one of the things I appreciated about the book. It's It was very – it's easy for people to read and understand. And while some of the – they may need to work on some of the things like let go and forgive, you know, that might be one they have to maybe read over a few times before they get it. 
But what's great is that they can make, uh, because you see people regardless where they're at, right? You have virtual Um, clients. Yes, yeah. yeah. Majority of my sessions are on the phone, and I do in-house consultations. I really, I don't have an office. I feel like it's really, this is such personal work, you know, and I show up 110% for my clients. Well, I'm I'm sure it makes people feel more comfortable when they can have a session in their own home, you know. (laughs) Mm-hmm. instead of having to drive out. But, you know, they can work on these different things. If they get stuck, you know, then they can make an appointment with you and, and work through whatever it is that they're going through. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and you one had, of the mm-hmm. – go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say one of the pieces, one of the epiphanies I really had for me is, like, whatever relationship we have, It could be a 20-year marriage or, like, Mm -hmm. a 20-hour relationship, you know. Um, It's just, it's just a, you know, sometimes it's a ring of a tree or sometimes it's just a scratch on the tree. But you have to remember that you are the tree, you know. Mm -hmm. This is your life, your life to live and to accumulate those experiences and to go through them. And, again, breakup rehab really helps with this, like, major life transition. Well, I think your your book is so helpful. It's got such great information, and uh, gosh, with your levels giftedness, I mean, it's, it just makes it a, a full package when people are looking to kind of move beyond their pains and and you know get ready to start life over again. Mm-hmm. As I say, start over stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, hey Rebecca, you know, thank you so much for, you know, spending time with us. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community? Um so the best way to plug in is my website at rebeccafreedom.com. That's R E B E K A H freedom.com and get on Facebook, look up Breakup Rehab Support Group. And join the group because that's where I'll be offer I'll be doing my offerings of the 90 day detox from breakup and also the book club and I have a lot of other really great things that are coming up. So again, RebeccaFreedom.com and then on Facebook at Breakup Rehab Support Group. Wow, you know Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. My pleasure. Well, that's the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit MomentsWithMarianne.com for more information.